In the realm of American heroes, there are few who loom larger than Abraham Lincoln. As America's 16th president, he ended slavery and won the Civil War, keeping a divided nation together. But in Lincoln's last trial, the murder case that propelled him to the presidency, we meet the Lincoln who came before. Written by ABC News chief legal affairs anchor Dan Abrams and co-author David Fisher, the book resurrects a high-profile murder case from 1859. When my co-author brought me this story, right, he said to me, you know, there's a, a full transcript out there of a Lincoln case, Lincoln for the defense. And it's the only transcript that exists of any trial Lincoln's ever argued. That transcript was recorded by Robert R. Hitt, an early innovator in the field of court stenography. Hitt, who later became an assistant U.S. Secretary of State and a congressman, was hired by the well-off family of the defendant, Peachy Quinn Harrison. At the time, Lincoln's profile was rising following the historic Lincoln-Douglas debates on slavery and states' rights. But no one could have predicted that the following year he would win the presidency. This was a tough case, and people were watching. And Lincoln pulled it off. And I think that that helped. Why Lincoln's doing what he's doing. As a lawyer, journalist, and analyst, Abrams has covered some of the biggest trials of our time, from his early days covering O.J. Simpson for Court TV to his current role at ABC News, where he interprets daily developments in the Trump-Russia investigation. Everyone's sort of presuming that Michael Cohn could just flip on everything. Abrams also hosts the hugely popular Live PD on A&E. Looks like it lost a wheel. And he's the CEO and founder of Abrams Media, owner of Mediaite.com and LawandCrimeTV.com, which live streams high-profile trials from across the country. The galleries were filled at uh, the trial of Peachy Quinn Harrison, overflow courtroom every day. And people wanted to come watch. And I, and I think that people have the right to see when you know, they're representing the people as the prosecutors, people have a right to see how they're doing. Find out what surprised Abrams about Lincoln's last trial in this legal edition of Maryville Talks Books, one-on-one -on -one with Dan Abrams, presented by Maryville University and Left Bank Books, and media sponsors St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU, and HEC TV. Dan Abrams, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So the book is Lincoln's Last Trial, and you just got some great news about it. Yeah, we just uh, heard that we made the, uh, the New York Times uh, bestseller list uh, for nonfiction in our, uh, our first week. So uh, that's exciting to have made the top 10. You know, I'm glad that uh, after all that work, people are going to read it. Uh, and people are reading it, apparently, which is great. It's true, because you work so far out. Well, that's the thing. People will ask me some small detail about the book, and I'm thinking, huh. I mean, we finished, we sort of handed it in almost eight months uh, ago. Um, and so, you know, they'll say, well, you know, on page, I'll have a Lincoln historian say, on page, you know, this page, you referred to uh, an unpaved street. And uh, where did you get your information that, this, that, that those streets were not paved at that time? <sighs> you know what? Give me, give me a minute. Uh, let me go back to our uh, little bit of our research. It'll take me a little time to get back to you. So. Right, because they live and breathe everything. They do. Weekend. They do. And look, and, and, and that's, you know, we learned a lot from the, you know, the people who do live um, uh, the Lincoln life. Um, you know, I'm someone who has always uh, appreciated history. I'm definitely a history buff, but I learned so much from the real Lincoln historians every day. In fact, you know, one of them interviewed me the other day and I sort of flipped it on him and said, you know what, I really need to be interviewing you uh, because I'd love to know what you think about this and what do you think about that? Um, and so, you know, that's fun for me is that now I can at least be part of that conversation as uh, someone who's learning. Was that a surprise for you, that hardcore kind of no. audience? No, no, I knew that there would be, and this is again why the research was so important, is that I knew that as a TV guy, uh, who is not a historian, you touch Lincoln and you are risking touching a third rail. And, uh, and I recognized that from the beginning. Again, which is why every detail was so important to me, which is why David and I went back and forth on so many questions about facts and how do we know this and uh, presumptions, et cetera. 
because I know that there are a lot of people out there who know a lot more about Lincoln than do I. And so the point is, let's stay in our lane. Let's stay on Lincoln the lawyer, but most importantly, Lincoln in this trial, leading up to this case. And I think in that sense, I think we did a, a very good job. And so when I'm asked questions now about um, uh, Lincoln, and you know, look, I now know a lot more about Lincoln than I did, um, but I am relying obviously on some of these people um, who have lived a life of, of studying Lincoln and I have great admiration for them. What did this trial reveal about Lincoln that the nation came to see him as a leader and the leader they needed? You know, I don't know that this trial really uh, sort of built Lincoln up as a, as a leader per se. I think it, it, it enhanced his profile. It solidified him as one of the nation's great lawyers. It made him a, a winner. This was a tough case and people were watching and Lincoln pulled it off. And I think that that helped. He had a lot of personal connections to both sides of this case. Yeah, so the, um, the victim had worked in his law office. Um, Lincoln liked him. Uh, Lincoln thought he was a really promising young man. Um, he'd had relations, a relationship with the family of the defendant. Um, he'd actually served in a war with a cousin of, of, uh, uh, of the defendant. Um, so there were a lot of connections for him. Um, the star witness in the case was Peter Cartwright, who was a longtime political rival of, of Lincoln's and far more famous than Lincoln was at the time of the trial. So there was a lot of complications uh, for Lincoln in connection with this case, but reading the transcript, the only transcript that exists of any Lincoln trial, reading Lincoln's words as an attorney, and you see why he was, you know, he was really a skilled attorney. And that's really the other star of this story is Mr. Robert Hitt and this transcript. I mean, that went on to transform trials. These days, it's, it's expected. Of course you transcribe. Back then, transcription was a relatively new thing, and um, the family had enough money that um, they could hire Hitt to be there every day, and Lincoln was the one who recommended him. And it was a huge thing. I mean, we don't even realize that there was an era when things weren't written down and there wasn't such a detailed record like this. You know, when, when my co-author brought me this story, right, he said to me, um, you know, there's a, a full transcript out there of a Lincoln case, Lincoln for the defense, and it's the only transcript that exists of any trial Lincoln's ever argued. And it was discovered in 1989 in the garage of the great-grandson of the defendant. I said to him, come on can't be the only transcript, can't be that no one cares. How is it that no one has done something on this already? And of course, I investigated. He was absolutely right. And so we sort of dug into the history of it. Um, and it was the only transcript because cases weren't transcribed. Um, it just wasn't ordinary course of, uh, of business. But what makes the, the book and the story so fascinating is you do have Lincoln's own words there, uh, questioning witnesses. Tell me more about that story. That was so interesting. It was the home, the great grandson of the defendant, Peachy Harrison, had died. And um, in that home, in the garage, found a, was found a box, um, chewed up, kind of beaten up, with a yellow bow around it. And the family had apparently been passing it along. So when the trial ended, yeah. without giving away the, the ending, yeah. what happened next in Lincoln's life and our lives? Let's just say that, um, that I think that Lincoln left this trial even more well-respected, uh, which, which he was already one of the, the best known and best respected lawyers in what was known as the West at that point. Um, and I think that this trial um, further solidified that. So we're now we're post Lincoln Douglas debates. He's more well known than he was during the Almanac trial. 
and I think that he's now, he's a star lawyer coming out of this case. And I think that that helped propel him ultimately to the presidency. And that happened very fast after this, within the next year to 15 months. So this is, this is September of 1859. The Republican uh, convention is uh, June of, two, of, 19, of 1860. So, and it's, it's at the Republican convention that really, you know, that no one would have thought it would be Lincoln who would be the, the candidate. And then when he was the candidate, uh, I think it was even considered even more of a long shot that he would win. And at the time of this trial, when he was being urged to, to go forth as a dark horse candidate, he himself said, I don't think I'm ready for this. Yeah, I mean, look, who knows what, you know, I, I think he meant that, but I think that he didn't mean I'm not ready uh, in terms of not being able. I think he meant I don't think I'm going to win. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that, that, and he was probably right, that it was a, it was a long shot uh, for him to win. One of the reviews in USA Today mentions, too, this idea of the sort of hazy myth of, of who Abraham Lincoln was, Honest Abe. Was part of your motivation trying to find that human being behind that sort of iconic image that we have of him? I, I think part of, the, part of the goal here was to find the, the real lawyer. So, so you know, I'm not going to suggest that this is a book that is going to give you deep psychological insight into Abraham Lincoln. There are a lot of books that have done that with people who have studied um, Lincoln's life as a career. What we did is we focused on Lincoln the lawyer. And I do think you walk away from this book, in addition to, I hope, enjoying a compelling case and story about a sort of amazing murder trial, but also learning about Lincoln's legal career um, and learning a little bit more insight into, into Lincoln the lawyer. Did it humanize Lincoln for you? Um, it certainly gave me better insight into Lincoln. And I think one of the, the moments that struck me most uh, in terms of Lincoln the person was there's a moment in the, in the case where the judge initially rules against allowing Peter Cartwright to testify. And the reason his testimony was so important was he, in addition to having to be, happening to have been the grandfather of the defendant, was also uh, one of the most famous preachers in America at the time. And so he had gone to counsel uh, Greek Crafton before he died. And he's there with him, and Greek allegedly says to him, um, I don't blame uh, Quinn, I, I brought this upon myself. Um, and you know, that's a huge statement. I brought this upon myself. And the question became, should that be viewed? Typically, you don't allow hearsay in, right? The victim isn't there to testify. Is this a dying declaration uh, that should be admissible in court? And the judge initially ruled, was going to rule or did rule that it was not going to be admitted. Peter Cartwright was not going to be able to testify to that statement. And to get the contemporaneous quotes from Herndon, <clears throat> the court crier, and others who were there. Talk about how angry Lincoln got. Shows us another side of Lincoln that I hadn't seen or read about. Um, we always think of Abe Lincoln sitting there stroking his beard, sort of calmly thinking about what to do next. He was furious, filled with anger at the judge over this ruling. And I think that does humanize him. It shows that he was a vigorous advocate beyond just being a sort of, you know, legal mind. Going back to the transcripts, what was it like for you when you saw them for the first time or read through them for the first time to see all of that and know that this had been in a courtroom with So him? part of the, the amazing thing for me was seeing the blanks, right? Was seeing the spots where Hit couldn't figure out what had been said in court. Um, but what struck me, one of the things that struck me most was how Lincoln knew when to stop. Um, and that's a real sign of a great trial lawyer, is it's not just what do you say, it's what you don't say. Um, when he would end a line of questioning knowing that he'd be able to get better testimony from another witness on this, don't muddy the water, keep it clear, keep it focused, make sure the jury understands the points you're making, and stop. And I think that's one of the things that I was really impressed by 
And when you like talk that. about propelling him to the presidency, was it that sort of level of confidence and self? So, so I think that the pro propelling him to the presidency part was in part the timing, right? 1858, you've got the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Um, he's kind of fading from public view a little bit. Um, yeah, he's still being asked to give speeches, et cetera. But this case was widely covered. And um, I think this elevated his profile again. He had everything to lose by taking it. He won the case. Um, and I think, in, in, in fact, some of the people involved in the case ended up working on his 1860 campaign. And one of the prosecutors has actually taken credit for the seating at the campaign at the Republican convention, saying that because of the way he sat the delegates, Lincoln was able to get more access to the undecideds, and that helped him uh, win the nomination. The transcript, of course, as you mentioned, a complete gift here, but you have a very extensive bibliography. I mean, this was an extensively researched. The transcript, in many ways, was the beginning. Well, that's right. And so, so then the goal was, okay, because the transcript in and of itself is confusing, right? If I just, you know, if we just put out the 100 pages in the transcript, it's a little boring at times. It's um, slow. Uh, and, it, and again, like the where things were happening is a little confusing. And so we took that as the yoke of the story and then decided, okay, now let's, let's build this out. Let's, and what we did is, in addition to using contemporaneous newspaper and magazine, et cetera, uh, you know, periodical quotes from the time, um, we researched, for example, you know, we were able to find out who the jurors were um, and, um, and added that uh, to, the, um, to the story here. Um, we were able to talk about Springfield at that time. Every detail in the book is accurate. Names of saloons and hotels. And in fact, there's one point when we talk about a day when Lincoln goes to buy things at the drugstore. And that was actually um, something that my co-author had inserted. And I said to him, I said, come on, we don't want to, we, we, I don't want to invent things that Lincoln's buying at the drugstore. I said, what? He said, no, no. He said, we know. There's a, actually a log of everything that's known about Abraham Lincoln every day. And in that log, it talks about the various items, including some sort of bed bug remedy that Lincoln had bought on that day during the trial. Um, and so, so any time we recreated or presumed, we used it as a vehicle to describe something that we knew existed. So if there was a periodical or something where we wanted to get that quote out, we might say, you know, that Hitt was talking to a particular person who pulled out the periodical and then read the quote from the periodical. So everything was a means to an end in terms of anything that we um, um, recreated in terms of thinking or private conversations. As a writer and a reporter, what was it like, though, to work with somebody uh, as a co-author? It sounds like it would be uh, fun. Well, look, I was actually nervous about it um, because I've always written everything myself, right? I mean, you know, anytime I write an article or I go on air or I do anything, I write it, almost always research it myself. So it was, it was a little bit... Um, uh, disconcerting at first to have someone, and this is why I pushed him a lot, is because, you know, I was concerned uh, and I had never experienced this before. But I think both of us uh, have said that this collaboration has been far better than either of us could have imagined. I think that I've been so impressed with him and I think he has been surprised by how, let's just say, involved at every level I am in the writing and in the, um, you know, in the process um, of this, um, that I think it's been a sort of a mutual admiration. You dedicate this book to your father, Floyd yep. Abrams, who is a legendary First Amendment lawyer. Yep. Um, yeah, my dad is, uh, look, my dad has always been someone who encouraged me to, to read. Uh, my dad was a voracious reader uh, when I was a kid. He's always been a, had a love for history. Um, and so I think that, you know, I've done a lot of things in my career, 
But for my father, I think, you know, writing a, a book on Lincoln the lawyer, in his mind, is a different level uh, than, you know, covering a tabloid legal trial. Uh, so so I, was, I was really um, pleased to be able to, to dedicate the book to him and uh, for him to, uh, to be able to, uh, to read it. The law is kind of your family business, right? Your sister's a federal judge. My did sister's... you grow up always? I mean, did you always want to be, or did you, you know, I, know were you my, conflicted? My sister always wanted to be a lawyer and has been a very successful lawyer um, and now federal judge. Um, my dad used to tell us stories about his cases when we were kids. I think part of having a father who has succeeded in anything uh, makes you think, oh, that could be a cool profession. Um, but I think that for me, um, you know, I, I worked at a law firm for a little bit, and I, I just think in the end it, it really wasn't uh, the, the right fit, but I really enjoyed having learned the law, and uh, I was able to, to transition it, luckily, into, into something else which is related to the law. You've carved out really this unique career and place in legal affairs. I've been lucky. I mean, look, it's, it's, there are a lot of lawyers who I talk to who say, you know, how did you, how did you get the job you have? I'd love, to, I'd love to do something like that. And my answer is part of it was just being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I happened to be when covering high profile trials became a thing in the mid-90s, I happened to be in the right place for it. And these days, um, it's, it's harder, um, although there is certainly for former federal prosecutors a, uh, a renewed interest in having them do analysis on TV in, uh, in the midst of the, uh, the Mueller investigation. And I noticed that one of your main uh, jobs is gently bringing everyone back to the actual legal issues that are at stake here because there's been so much speculation and so much gossip and conjecture that uh, you see the value of what you do and that you clarification is needed on a lot of these things. Well, There's it's context <clears throat> that's needed because people will say, um, can you imagine that this X, Y, or Z happened? And I can say, well, actually that happens all the time or well, actually that never happens. In high profile cases, I will get people saying to me, why isn't, Lindsay Lohan serving more time? Why hasn't Justin Bieber been deported? Um, and, you know, the answer is because they didn't commit crimes that people serve a lot of time for. Or no one else in that situation uh, would face that. And sometimes that's hard for people to, uh, to accept. Before we go, I'd love to ask you just about your life now. I don't know where you found time to do all this. You're, you have a, a son, a, a family, a media empire. You own... Uh, a ton of websites, uh, companies. Uh, yeah. You're a busy guy. So a lot of things going on, which is why, you know, this book couldn't have been done without my co-author David Fisher. Uh, I am, you know, I'm the legal uh, guy for ABC News. Um, I host a show on A and E called Live PD. Um, and that's kind of a new yeah. avenue for you, right? Uh, those t the two shows that you're doing through yeah so AA. the well live pd is a monster hit and so that's uh that's been an, a new thing for me is um i have this abc news news guy life and i've got my a and e live pd life and the two don't intersect much people who see me on live pd don't realize that i've been doing legal analysis and hosting shows for a long time and the people in the abc world don't know what live pd is um, and so it's kind of fun uh, in that regard to have very different communities of, uh, of people. Um, but most of my time is spent on the business. I mean, we've sort of recreated Court TV on the internet. Uh, and it's now going well beyond the internet in terms of being a, um, a channel that's being distributed on OTT and linear platforms where we cover live trials. And um, again, this comes back to people's fascination with watching a trial. Um, do you remember meeting with uh, Rhonda uh, Colley, right on that day? I do. The galleries were filled 
at uh, the trial of Peachy Quinn Harrison. Overflow courtroom every day. Um, people wanted to come watch. Um, and, I, and I think that people have the right to see the people of the state of Missouri or the people of the state of New York or California um, uh, when you know, they're representing the people as the prosecutors. People have a right to see how they're doing. Um, and I think that uh, that's what we're doing with the Law and Crime Network. So what's next for you? Uh, you've got a lot of things in the air. Do you think you'd write a, another book? Did this sort of open the window for you in examining some other historical cases will, of significance? I will give you a hint, which is this was a two-book deal. Um, and uh, we have another very exciting project that we're already working on. You're going to meet a lot of your fans tonight. And I know you meet them throughout your work in general. What's it like to... Uh, well, the, the interesting thing is that the fans who will be here are primarily going to be live PD uh, fans because, you know, in New York and L.A. and Washington, I'm the ABC News guy. Um, in much of the rest of the country, it's about live PD. Um, and um, you'll and see the passion of the live PD nation uh, who are truly committed to that show and that uh, what it reflects every night we do it. Why are you so passionate about that show? I think that it, it shows and I think that it offers an important lens on what police officers do every day. There's a lot of talk about policing in this country. And typically in the media and in the news, we focus on the extremes. Most often the negative extreme, which is there's been an officer involved shooting. Sometimes heroism by a police officer but never the sort of, here's what we do the rest of the time, which is what most officers are dealing with. And that's what we show. Unlike a show like Cops, which is greatest hits of police officers, we're showing a traffic stop. We're showing what police officers do on a daily basis. And I think that the audience appreciates that. And I think that's part of what may, has made the show such a hit. And rewarding to be a part of that. Yeah, no, it's great to be part of a community. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled with that show. Dan Abrams, thank you so much for joining sure, us. Sure, my pleasure.